In today's post-war turmoil and the race for world markets, the industrial forces of all nations are turning to the lessons of war for the solution to their problems. No nation has greater cause for concern than Australia, for she knows that if she is to grow to full stature in the Pacific, if she is to multiply her population and develop her resources, she must first find cheaper, faster, more economical ways of handling and transporting Australia's vast natural products. Keenly conscious of this, Australia's federal government has already succeeded in setting up the nucleus of an amazing organisation, unique and unparalleled anywhere in the world. Known as the Commonwealth Handling Equipment Pool, it has, since cessation of war, speedily developed into a powerful, smooth-functioning scheme, extending into four states. But to really tell the story of the Commonwealth Handling Equipment Pool, we must go back to the days when war in the Pacific was a desperate life-and-death adventure a race against time and the Jap. Someone remembered that one man with a bulldozer can move more earth in an hour than 20 men can move by hand in a day. If one piece of mechanism can shift mighty loads of earth, why not other mechanical giants to shift mighty loads of supplies from factory to wharf, from wharf to ship, and then repeat the entire operation in reverse at the other end? Quite suddenly, there appeared on Australian wharves and docksides a new race of mechanical giants nimble, fast-moving giants like this forklift truck. This machine absolutely revolutionized the method and time employed in stacking, loading, unloading, handling almost anything and everything in all shapes and sizes. Came also mobile cranes, fixed boom and swing boom cranes, capable of lifting upwards of two tons. Truck-mounted cranes that could toss with effortless ease enormous loads of 12 to 15 tons. The crawler-type crane, picking up in its stride upwards of 40 tons in one lift. The straddle truck, which tucks its load between its wheels and thinks nothing of scooting off at 40 miles an hour. Battalions of these machines went forward across the Pacific to toil on every landing beach, along every jungle trail. Then war ended and the work of the giant machines was finished. Their drivers packed up, their units shipped back home. The machines stayed on, forgotten derelicts, rusting on beaches or covered with jungle vines. But not for long. Australia turned from war to face enormous post-war problems the race to reorganize and re-establish old and new industries. The race for all important overseas markets was on. With even fewer men than before the war, Australia confronted the task of achieving expansion in industry, of speeding up production, and above all, of speeding up transport to hitherto unknown velocities. It couldn't be done by going back to outmoded methods. It could be done by maintaining, developing and extending the nation's Commonwealth Handling Equipment Pool. Wise government foresaw in this organisation something that went far beyond its original wartime objective. Within its grasp, it realised a potent, priceless powerhouse. Should trouble again threaten the peace, then the Commonwealth Handling Equipment Pool would be a number one defence priority. Army, Navy and Air Force all had found this organisation an indispensable link in the lifeline between the mainland and operational areas. Retention on that score alone was imperative. Manufacturers dependent upon imported raw materials had come to rely also upon the Commonwealth Handling Equipment Pool for speeding up the delivery of materials from ship to factory and through the production line. Shipping companies, faced with the nerve-wracking task of maintaining Australia's seaborne traffic, with a depleted merchant navy, 
looked anxiously to the same organization to cut down loading and unloading periods so that sorely needed ships could be turned around with minimum delay. For all these vital reasons, Australia's federal government determined to press ahead with the expansion of the Commonwealth Handling Equipment Pool. The initial step was to bring back the abandoned equipment from Pacific bases. Out of ships' holes, the war-worn machines emerged, some apparently fit only for the scrap heap. From the wharves, they were hauled to the vast inspection sheds. Engineers went to work. Their task to select the type of equipment most urgently required. Machines like the forklift truck. Spare parts for replacement were unprocurable. But this did not deter the engineering staff of Commonwealth Handling Equipment Pool, who promptly set up a machine shop to manufacture in part the necessary replacements and judiciously exploit the enterprise of private engineering firms, thus reducing cannibalizing to a minimum. The miracles achieved are glowing tributes to Australian engineering skill. Then commenced the work of repairing, welding and reconditioning. And in the assembly works, engines and parts were put together again. When finally reassembled and tested, they went to the spraying and painting shops. Emerging in shiny new coats and the keenest eye of the most expert mechanic could detect no flaw in them. Whilst engineering shops laboured mightily to bring these derelict mechanical monsters back to surging life, another phase of the master plan was simultaneously in operation. Special schools of instruction had been set up for only expert drivers, qualified by aptitude and intensive training, would be entrusted with the mission of taking the machines wherever most needed and to perform the wide range of tasks demanded in a day's work. Most vital appeals came from industries crippled by bottlenecks, shipping, housing, forestry, coal mining. The technical department closely analyzes every application to determine the order of priority and the allocation of the most suitable equipment. Decisions are relayed to the dispatch department and put into effect. The operational chart shows how this system works. Every machine in or out of commission is listed, giving its number, mileage, oil change and maintenance. The operational chart also registers the daily assignment and the location of each machine in work. Machines and drivers are supplied to industries on a daily or period hire basis. Mechanics overhaul machines before departure, the dispatch officer personally making a final checkup. In some cases, the companies provide drivers, but generally, upon the equipment pool devolves the work of maintenance, repair, fueling, and planning. Let's follow this forklift truck which is being loaded onto a low transporter for a typical day's work. A call has come from a Royal Naval Warehouse. A 6,000 ton cargo of foodstuffs must be shifted from shipping shed into receiving shed and restacked. Six forklift trucks are put on the job, but the two sheds are 600 yards apart. That means a fairly long haul. So the technical department has also allocated six tractor trains, each consisting of eight dolly trucks. Wear and tear on the forklift trucks is thus reduced to a minimum. For although these are capable of traveling loads any reasonable distance, they are primarily designed as lifting equipment. The cargo has been stacked in cases on pallets, 40 cases on each. The forklift trucks pick up two pallets with each lift, 80 cases, a combined weight of two tons.
When loaded, each train moves off at highway speed with 16 tonnes of freight, whilst the forklift trucks turn back to the job of unstacking and loading the next train. At the receiving shed, the second group of three forklift trucks attack the train, again picking up two tonnes per lift and restacking in the new position. On this job, between 350 to 380 tonnes of foodstuffs per day were handled by each forklift truck. The entire 6,000 tonnes was moved and restacked in five days, two hours and 20 minutes by 12 men driving six forklift trucks and six tractor trains. This time included stoppages for meals and maintenance. The significance of this achievement may be appreciated when it is calculated that the same assignment, if handled manually, would have taken almost seven months. Shipping companies set the Commonwealth Handling Equipment Pool vastly different problems, which are solved with equal facility and a wide range of equipment. Every day, men and machines are sent out to load or unload ships, berthed at wharves in Sydney, Brisbane, Melbourne, Devonport, Burnie, and the main eastern ports. Here is a Lorraine crane supplementing ship's gear in the loading and discharging of ship's cargo. Operating from the wharf, the Lorraine crane augments the ship's winches, thus reducing to a minimum, and in some instances halving the time required in port to load and discharge cargo. These logs are part of a cargo loaded aboard the Hulk Mamba at Coffs Harbour and towed down to Sydney by tugs. The timber was discharged two weeks faster than could have been done by old stevedoring methods. That meant two weeks saved to shipping, to the timber mills, to builders and to home seekers. To watch this forklift truck handling these mammoth logs like matchsticks it seems hard to believe that each log weighs around five tons. Yet, handled by skilled drivers working under planned direction, the equipment performs stevedoring miracles in unloading, stacking and reloading for transport. For sawn timber, straddle trucks provide the answer. These unusual machines are designed to pick up a five-ton load of stacked timber and transport it from point to point at a speed equal to that of the average highway vehicle. From timber yard to wharf, or from wharf to timber yard, the straddle truck does the job with speed and in amazing contrast to the old manual method. In one swift operation, it can pick up five tons as quickly as it takes two men to handle a single plank. These machines are equally effective in handling steel, pipes or other similar commodities. This rouseabout five-ton crane, as its name implies, can be put to almost any purpose. Its slewing radius of 45 degrees enables it to pick up and load from a stationary point. This means no loss of terminal time. In all these fields of operation, and in a diversity of others that cannot be encompassed in this film, a technical staff acts as liaison between the Commonwealth Handling Equipment Pool and the industry client. Upon such trained officers rests the mission of carrying the gospel of mechanised handling to industries, factories, warehouses, workshops and wharves. In fact, to every conceivable enterprise where loading and stacking is part of the day's work.
To the technical and operational staff goes the credit of solving this problem for the Goodyear Rubber Company. Several acres of tyres salvaged during the war had accumulated on land now required for building. The task of removal was complicated by the fact that these tyres had been left out in all weathers and most were filled with water. It needed two men to lift each tyre. The equipment pool undertook the work and sent along this link belt 75 crane. With two bites, the crane loads a five-ton truck in a matter of seconds. The total saving in time amounted to months. The saving in manpower needs no emphasis. The overhead railway at Sydney Circular Quay presented a major construction headache. But again, the Commonwealth Handling Equipment Pool found the solution. Construction engineers estimated that the erection of prefabricated steel sections across the roadway would take one full week. That meant a complete stoppage of tram and road traffic in a main city street. The equipment pool sent a Lorraine and a P&H crane onto the job. Picking up 14 ton sections at a time, these two cranes operating in unison lifted into position 75 tons of bridge girders in five hours. An estimated four weeks work was telescoped into less than one day and a serious traffic holdup was averted. But transcending all these vital services to industry is one of supreme national urgency. Australia, like all manufacturing nations, needs more and still more coal so that her industry shall not lack the fuel that feeds the furnaces. Without coal, industry cannot exist, let alone expand. Daily, the race to step up coal production becomes more desperate. To relieve the situation, open cut mining is being developed. But for every ton of coal won, a vast amount of overburden must first be dug away and shifted. Commonwealth Handling Equipment Pool is responding to the call and throwing every ounce of its resources into the breach. Here we see a unit working an open-cut mine at Bacchus Marsh, Victoria. Beneath this seven-acre paddock lies 700,000 tonnes of coal in a seam 97 feet deep. To get to it, the overburden must first be dug out to a depth of 33 feet. Assigned to this work are link belt or crawler cranes operating drag line shovels. This equipment scoops up and loads directly onto trucks 800 tonnes of overburden per day. In 10 weeks, this machine moved 165,000 tonnes of earth and one for Australia, 10,000 tonnes of coal. It would take 750 men six months of solid work to achieve the same output. Industry could never afford to buy low-grade coal at such prohibitive cost. Only by the use of mechanisation can open-cut mining costs be kept down to an economical basis. This Bay City mobile crane not only lifts and shifts heavy loads, it can also cover long distances under its own power. Here one is seen in operation at Warren Gamber Dam for Sydney's Metropolitan Water, Sewerage and Drainage Board. A pipeline is being laid from the dam to Sydney. Heavy sections of pipe, each weighing between five and seven tonnes, must be carried to different points of assembly, separated over distances of several miles. This Bay City mobile crane responded perfectly to this roving assignment. 
Construction was stepped up because of its ability to speed from point to point at a moment's notice. Building bomb blast walls around these petrol tanks was a comparatively simple job. Demolishing them proved a tough nut for the contractor. Behind the walls of brick and concrete, the steel tanks were rusting. It was imperative to apply a protective coat of paint. But first came the difficult job of demolition. The contractor secured from the equipment pool a Norwest crane with an 80-foot boom, capable of swinging right around the job. Recommended because uneven ground levels made it necessary to operate the crane from a stationary point. But the crane was merely put to hauling buckets of rubble chipped away by gangs working on scaffolding. Worried by the slowness of this method, the contractor again consulted the equipment pool experts. Their solution was simplicity itself. Take away the bucket and give the crane a chance to really go to work. Have the man jackhammer the walls into two-ton sections and let the crane yank it out. Reorganized on this basis, the contractor finished in seven days what he originally feared would take as many weeks. Here is the pictorial proof. At each lift, the Norwest crane picks up a slab weighing from two to three tons and drops it neatly into the waiting truck. Obviously, there is no lost terminal time. With equal ease, the Norwest crane makes light of this unusual job of picking up and loading petrol tanks for removal to another depot. Each tank is 35 feet high and weighs seven tons. Operating a 50-foot boom, this type of crane can lift 25 tons. With an 80-foot boom, it can handle a six-ton lift. Commonwealth Handling Equipment Pool has already earned a nationwide reputation. Every day it is helping to solve the problems of an ever-increasing clientele. Private enterprise has welcomed with open arms the opportunity to harness its industrial needs to this unique powerhouse of mechanized energy. A great deal has been achieved in the fight for Australia's industrial future. A great deal remains because this federal organization is no mere stopgap invention. It is a well-forged chain that one day will girdle the continent, bringing modern aids to every city and inland town where industry and enterprise need mechanized help. And so ends, or rather begins, the fabulous story of the Commonwealth Handling Equipment Pool, a national enterprise which makes miracles of handling seem all in the day's work. It is a story that began in vision and has no ending. It is part of the pattern of a great and growing nation marching onwards to a magnificent destiny.